Hello guys, my name is Eric Sierra and I'm going to be presenting uh, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome or AIDS. And this is the HIV virus that causes the Acquired, um, acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome or AIDS. And um, this condition is not just one simple condition but uh, a wide variety of conditions that arise from the HIV virus uh, basically destroying your immune system. And here we have a detailed picture of the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. You can see it's surrounded by an envelope, and it has uh, spikes or receptors called glycoprotein receptors. And um, this, is, this is what the virus is going to use to attach to its, um, its host. As you can see here, here are the internal structures. Um, you can see what we talked about in the previous image, the receptors, the glycoprotein 120. And you could also see that it's surrounded by a lipid membrane or an envelope. And inside the envelope, you're going to have a nucleocapsid, um, which is basically a capsid made out of protein. And inside you have uh, RNA, single-stranded RNA, that um, will be used along with uh, reverse transcriptase to... Um, make uh, double-stranded DNA which will be incorporated into the host genome and um, here we have this is how the, the HIV virus is specific for CD4 um, cells and um, the, CD, the CD4 is a glycoprotein, a glycoprotein present on the T, the on CD4 cells for example T, T cells, T lymphocytes, uh, macrophages and brain cells such as astrocytes and they're present on the top of the, or the they're present on their on their on the surface of the of their membrane. And the uh, AIDS virus, they I'm sorry, the HIV virus is going to attach to these glyco CD4 glycoprotein glyco glycoproteins with its um with its glycoproteins. So it's um, glycoproteins 120, which is a receptor or spikes. And um, once this um a D GP120, which is the receptor of the HIV virus, binds to the uh, CD4 receptor of the. Well, here we have the HIV virus, and it's going to bind with its receptor to the receptor of the of of the CD4 cell. Once it binds, the, um, another molecule called the V3 loop, it's going to interact with the uh, with the core with a lot with, with the co-receptors along with the GP120 with the co-receptors to um, confirma confirmationally change the structure of the receptor so that the another receptor called the glycoprotein 41 from the AIDS virus can shoot out and open a hole into the um, into the CD4 cell so that way the HIV virus can penetrate and uh, once the HIV virus is able to penetrate, uh, the membrane will fuse with the CD4 cell membrane. And the uh, genetic material containing the, caps, the capsid, which is RNA, it's going to interact with the rever reverse transcriptase enzyme, which is going to turn the single-stranded DNA into a double-stranded DNA template, which then would, um, would go into the nucleus, and will the enzyme integrates will incorporate that double strand of DNA from the virus into the host genome. Now, once the, the the DNA is incorporated into the cell, it's not going to start a lytic cycle, or it's not going to go to the lytic cycle. It's not going to create. It's not going to create viral proteins right away and destroy the cell and and uh, and, and destroy it to be released. It's going to go into a lysogenic cycle. Which is going to remain dormant for a while. It could be two months to eight years. It depends on each individual, and um, it's going to stay dormant until some type of stress will, um, or some type of stress will activate this virus, and then it will go into the lytic cycle where it will start making the viral proteins, and it will destroy the cell. And this is a good um, evasive maneuver to evade the immune system because uh, antibodies cannot bind to it because it's inside the cell and no medication can can really target it once it's inside the cell because 
it, it's going to have to kill the cell. And um, you don't want to use a medication that's going to kill the cell because if you use that, you'll destroy like thousands and hundreds of thousands of cells in your body. You don't want to. You don't want to have that because that will harm you. Okay, so the origin of HIV. It's believed that uh, HIV one. There's two types of HIVs. HIV one and HIV two. The difference is that HIV one. It's more aggressive than HIV two, and HIV two is more rare, of course. And um, HIV one. It's believed to originate from the chimpanzee, which inside the chimpanzee it wasn't HIV. It was a semen immunodeficiency virus, which crossed the species barrier into humans for it to become HIV. And this is what gave rise to HIV-1. And uh, Suri Mangavi um, monkey gave rise to HIV-2. And likewise, it, uh, the virus crossed, the SIV virus crossed the species barrier into humans. And um, it, it became and mutated into the HIV-2 virus. And uh, the most um, the most common theory, uh, or the most accepted theory that believes, that, that um, not believes, that, that suggests what happened, and it's still, this theory is still occurring today, is that humans in, uh, in Africa, and um, during the uh, time before the 1980s, it was believed that um, people were were people were constructing roads and destroying forests to build, for example, cities and, and villages. And um, these people were, will, as they cut down the trees, they will butch. They will also butcher the monkey, the chimpanzees, or the mangabe monkeys for to be able to eat them as food. So when they butchered these monkeys, the blood from the monkeys um, or the uh, the chimpanzees was transmitted through their blood. So if you butcher the monkey, the blood from the from the animal will get into cuts that you will have in your skin, and uh, this is what transmitted the SIV virus into the human and became the HIV um, the HIV virus. And um, and uh, today it, that's banned to uh, butcher these monkeys because we were trying to prevent the SIV from continuing to cross over and cause HIV in humans. And this is, this is just a picture of um, Clay, the, the, the bad guy from Tarzan. As you could see, he was like what, like the hunter that hunted down the monkeys. And um, this is a picture of Africa, like with a forest. Uh, okay, so HIV. Um, the first epidemic of HIV occurred in the 1981s, but HIV was prevalent before that, and there's evidence that suggests this because um, there was uh, HIV found in the plasma in plasma samples of a man in 1959 and a, and a sample of lymph node in 1960 in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is in Africa. And also in 1980, in 1998, uh, they, they examined um, the plasma from uh, from an HIV patient, from a patient, and uh, suggested that uh, that the HIV that the virus was introduced around the 1940s uh, and 1950s. And this could be possible because the the virus is um, lysogenic, so it takes time for it to appear. So it is possible that the virus was introduced in the 1950s and remained dormant until the 1980s, where it became uh, prevalent. And uh, it could be possible also because the virus could have been less aggressive initially, or uh, and also uh, people might have been dying, and it was maybe it was, it was it was not known why they were dying from because there was no test that tested for uh, the HIV virus at this time. It wasn't until 1981 where uh, numerous homo homosexual men showed up in, uh, in a hospital in Los Angeles and they were suffering from similar conditions. Uh, th these conditions are, st are still uh, current in AIDS patients. For example, Kaposi sarcoma, which is a, uh, it's, it's a type of skin cancer, and also pneumocystis carina or Giroveshi uh, pneumonia which uh, is, a, is a fungi. It was first believed to be a protozoan, and now it's believed to be um, a fungi. So they changed the name from Karini to Jirovishi. And um, also, the, the patients were also 
experiencing a low T cell count because the 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 HIV virus was destroying all the T lymphocytes, and um, there were also other opportunistic um, infections present in these homosexual men. And as you can see here, this is Kaposi's sarcoma. You can see the um, these you form these um, patches of uh, red colored uh, pigmentations on the skin. And also um, pneumocystis um, pneumonia. You can see that um, you can see the pneumonia. You can see the fungi growing on the lower part of the lungs, um, observed by these white spaces. So Kaposi's sarcoma. It's um, you can see it on the skin as as patches. These are like these are tumors, tumors in the blood um, lining, in the blood vessel lining, and you can see them as uh, uh, red or violet. Red or you can see kind of violet here, and uh, you could also you could also form them not just on your back but all over your body, including your skins, and more aggressively, it could form inside your organs. And this is this could happen in less than two years. It could attack the internal organs such as the lymph node, the GI tract, the liver, the spleen, and other soft tissues. And um, it's not the HIV virus that causes this condition, but uh, the HIV since it impairs the immune system, then you're going to have, and it will impair the immune system and it will also attract the herpes virus type 8, which will cause the Kaposi sarcoma to happen. And here you can see the, the sarcoma happening along the face of this individual. This is a before and after picture. And it could also happen on your gums, on your extremities. And even on your internal organs, this is a liver. You can see these. Um, you can have sarcoma on the lining of the t of the tissue, on the blood vessel lining of the tissue. You can see here uh, the formation of tumors. And the this condition could be very aggressive, and um, it, the, your organs will eventually lose function because of these tumors, and you could die from it. And um, okay, moving on. This is pneumocystis carina gerevich uh, pneumonia, which is uh, an opportunistic um, fungi, and uh, it, it, it takes residence in the alveoli spaces inside your lungs. So they'll be located here, and you could also see them here on this X-ray by the by, this, by the, the white the, the white uh, color formation here on the bottom of the lungs. This will be where the alveoli are present inside your lungs. And uh, it prevents the oxygen diffusion, so you're constantly going to be, um, uh, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to breathe. You're going to have a shortness of breath, and you're going to be coughing. You're going to have this dry cough with um, no mucus. And here you can see um, a tissue sample. You can see the organism here, present here. You can observe it here. Okay, let me know. So, um... In the 1981s, the population was uh, affected by this epidemic, and there was no test to um, to 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 see what. And nobody knew what caused this um, this 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 uh, phenomenon. And um, 19 there was in 1982 there was there were misconceptions. For example, the doctor physicians believed, like the the, the the scientific community believed that this condition only arose and. On gay men, so they term they gave the term gay related immune deficiency, which was um uh that was was disproved and became a misconception because now women were becoming infected with the HIV virus too because of course the infection can be uh, transmitted by um, sexual intercourse and um, drug users also became high risk. Uh, drug users that use uh, injections of heroin, like the needles, that will share the the blood from one uh, human to another one to another, and it will transmit the, uh, the it will transmit the, um, the the virus. Here is uh, a drug addict injecting themselves with a uh, with a uh, with whatever medication you take. He could be transmitting himself um, with the virus. And um, also, hemophiliacs were getting at this time were getting the the virus because there was no screen to um, to test the, the the blood that was donated from one individual to the other one. So an HIV positive infected individually could have easily transmitted the infection to um, to uh, 
to another human which was receiving the donation. For example, the case of Ryan White, which was um, which was a child basically. He was in, I believe, in high school, and he was a hemophiliac, which they 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 don't clot the blood the blood properly, and they constantly need a blood transfusion. So he received a blood transfusion from an HIV infected patient, and he he did not live to to be I believe older than 18 I believe he died when he was 18 he died very young also because the b blood wasn't screened correctly also um, the the mother it uh, was also observed that the mothers were also um, transmitting the HIV infection to their infants through the through the blood shared by the placenta so the babies can can become infected with HIV because the mothers blood is being shared with the baby that contain uh, the HIV infected blood that contain CD4 cells basically and and also um, if for any reason you encounter some type of drug user and you want to give them advice along in your career you, you could all they could um, disinfect their their needles with um, they could tell them they could disinfect their needles with um, with bleach which is going to pull the envelope right out of the virus because it's a detergent and uh, the, the virus would um, basically die and um, you're going to have to rinse the syringe with this um, uh, detergent solution such so as Clorox and uh, this bleach solution and then rinse it with water and this would disinfect the needles which I don't encourage anybody from doing drugs but if they are going to do drugs this will prevent them from getting HIV which is a million times worse so moving on, um, these were the two guys that identified the um, HIV virus, uh, Luc Montagnier, which was a French virologist. This is uh, uh, Montagnier. Um, it was the first to isolate um, the HIV virus, and he called it the lympho lymphadenopathy associated virus, -y virus or LAV. And also Robert Gallo, uh, he was a biochem, bio a medical researcher from the U.S. was the second one to discover the T, the, the HIV virus, and he called it the T lymphotrophic uh, virus type three. And these guys discovered this virus a couple of days from each other. Um, Luke Mundinier, uh was actually the first one to discover it, and accidentally uh, sent tissue samples from an HIV infected patient to Gallo which was also working on the HIV virus and um, this is how he he was able to uh, obtain a, a sample and um, conclude that uh, what they were observing was the HIV virus and thanks to them and this was discovered in 1983 two years after the primary epidemic and um, thanks to them in uh, 1985 a commercial test known as the, Eli the ELISA or enzyme linked immunosorbent assay was released to the to um, to everyone to, for AIDS to be detected and um, it could be better prevented and also um, treatment uh, became available soon but by this time um, 7,699 cases of AIDS were prevalent and um, around half of these uh, cases uh, were reported as deaths. So 3,665 were reported as deaths from um, AIDS. Uh, moving on, uh, the uh, ELISA um, test, it's uh, currently the most commonly used test and it was the first test to be performed and it uses antibodies to detect the HIV um, virus and it's indicated by color change. By color change, as you can see here, the yellow will indicate the presence of the virus, and the white will indicate a negative reaction to the virus. And um, when this ELISA test becomes uh, positive, this ELISA test becomes positive to uh, verify the results. A Western blot is used, which uh, uses uh, gel electrophoresis and it um, separates uh, the viral uh, particles and fragments and then binds the serum the serum from the patient to the the serum from the patient um, which has antibodies it binds them to the protein fragments that were that were that were fragmented by electrophoresis and as you can see here this is um, 
they ran the blood and blood on an HIV two patient, and uh, to to HIV two basically on a patient. So this will be the negative control. So this will give you a negative reaction. You you are HIV negative if you have this result, and this is an HIV positive control. This is how it will look like if you had HIV two. So this test was ran. They ran this test on two serums from two patients, and it was observed that、um, that this patient, or sample eleven and twelve, indeed had HIV two. As you can see, the alignment of、um, of the bands、um, due to the fragmentation of the viral proteins and、uh, the D, the antibodies binding to those.、Um, To those、uh, fragmented viral proteins, for example, the glycoproteins, which are present on the surface of the virus, and you can see that all these all these、um, glycoproteins they bind it at the same site as a positive control. Thus, the patients indeed would have、um, HIV two, and this test is still ran today to verify the ELISA test, and it's very reliable. And、um, Also,、um, needle stick and needle stick、um, needle sticks are when you stab yourself with an infect with a, a needle containing blood, and、uh, you, you health professionals risk、uh, being infected this way. And this happens very common. It actually happened to me.、Uh, I used to work for a doctor, and、um, I was given a PPD in injection, and carelessly I、uh, recapped the needle, and I actually stabbed myself in the thumb. With the needle, and it was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. I even my life flashed in front of my eyes, and、um, it was very scary. The scary part is not、uh, momentarily, but is actually having to wait to go through all these tests to、um, to verify if you're infected or not. You actually have to wait six months to you. You initially have to test. To see if you're HIV positive, and then if you're not, you're gonna have to retest again in six months to verify if you are or not, because the virus takes time、um, uh, because it's a lysogenic virus, so it remains dormant to produce、um, for your body to produce antibodies to it, so it could be detected by your immune system. So、uh, be very careful when you're handling needles and.、Um, Never recap once you give an injection.、Uh, this was a very careless mistake that I made, and it could have cost me my life or the quality of my life. So this is how the the result or when a physician orders orders a result. For example,、um, like what happened to me, a physician will order an HIV test or a ELISA test verified by a Western blot. That result will either come as a non-reactive. Meaning negative result or reactive, meaning that it's a positive result for HIV, or positive or negative, for example. Luckily, the results for me were negative, so yeah, thank God nothing happened to me. And the patient that the, the patient that also that um that uh, I was injecting um they, they also we also did a test on her for to test for HIV and she was also healthy, so yeah. Thank God. Okay, so、um, moreover,、uh, AIDS prognosis. So initially, after you're infected with the virus, you're not gonna、uh, see any symptoms until after、uh, about a week or a month after the infection. So these are very acute symptoms. So they will come and they will go、uh, shortly after, and they include fatigue.、Uh, you'll get a mild fever. Your swim. Your lymph nodes will be swollen, and you will have diarrhea. But they they eventually go away, and you will feel you will go back to normal. And、um, late as the as as the condition progresses,、uh, it will be termed the H related complex. And this this is、um, indicated by lymphadenopathy, which is、um, will last more than three months. It's basically just swollen lymph nodes. But um, these these are these are like the conditions from the acute HIV infection, but they're intensified. This th these will last longer, and they they will be more they will be more intense. And um, also you will you will experience night sweats. You will lose about ten percent of your 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 weight. 
you will lose weight, you will get a low grade fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you will have diarrhea for several weeks, and you will also um, feel fatigue. Here you can see a person experiencing night sweats, uh, swollen lymph nodes, you could, your cervical lymph nodes could be um, swollen, your, also your inguinal, your, your inguinal, your, your cervical, your inguinal lymph nodes could be, uh, uh, they could be swollen, uh, also your axillary lymph node could be swollen, and you also feel very tired, and um, after that condition, uh, usually around two years after, if left untreated, the AIDS-related complex will come back. This is term eight. This is what the AIDS condition will be like. Um, the AIDS-related complex, which was all of these conditions, will come back, and um, you will have a wasting syndrome. You you'll develop a dementia complex. Yeah, nephropathy. Which is basically your liver, your I'm sorry, your kidneys. Your you will have renal failure. Your kidneys will no longer work, and you'll probably have to be on dialysis. You'll de you'll develop Kaposi sarcoma, pneumocystis carina, pneumonia, like I mentioned before, and other uh, opportunistic infections. And uh, here we have the what I mentioned, the wasting syndrome. Uh, it's basically uh, extreme weight loss due to the AIDS condition. You will have chronic diarrhea for more than 30 days. You will lose your appetite. You will be vomiting. You'll feel weak, lethargy. You'll be depressed. You'll lose more than 10% of your weight, and your appetite will also be lost. And you will have fever for over 30 days. As you can see here in the picture, it's a very, very sad condition, which you lose like it could be it could be more than 10% of your weight. It could be very intensified. And you'll you'll you will feel very weak because of this condition. It's a very sad thing. Also, um, since AIDS attacks CD4 cells, um, your macrophages, which are which are cells that can cross the blood brain barrier, can infect brain cells such as astrocytes, which are CD4 cells. And your cell, your brain cells can become infected with HIV and uh, your brain cells can also be um, destroyed by the HIV virus and uh, you could experience uh, brain deterioration, loss of memory and, con uh, and concentration, confusion, slurred speech, trouble coordinating muscular activities. And here we have a picture of a, of a normal brain. As you can see, um, the ventricles of the brain, they're the, this shape. And this is the volume of the brain, and you can see the white matter. And this is a brain with Alzheimer's. You can see a brain with Alzheimer's is going to have larger ventricles, and it's going to have apparently less white matter. White matter, and it's going to be kind of deteriorated. It's going to—it's not going to form this shape. It's, right here is kind of deteriorated. It has a small, a smaller, smaller volume. And this is a a, 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 a patient that has eight, that has. Um, HIV positive cells on their brain and you can see that their ventricles are really enlarged and their white matter is kind of deteriorated as long as as well as your um, as your as, as the volume of their brain you can see the brain here is uh, it's, it's more full or has more volume than the one here it's more squished together and um, it has this brain deterioration that will lead to all of these symptoms it's uh, it's dementia, so you you're basically not you're not your brain's not gonna be as active. You're not gonna remember things as well as a normal person will be. Another this is another one of the very sad conditions that um, AIDS um, causes. So there is treatment out there that will prevent uh, the HIV virus from uh, binding at all these sites where it uh, it interacts with the cell. This treatment is called a highly active antiretroviral therapy or HEART and it's basically going to use numerous medications which is termed the AIDS cocktail because you have to take around 20 medications, 22 I believe, 22 medications every day uh, to be able to bind the, to be able to, um, to be able to, to stop the, the HIV virus from binding 
at all of these sites in the cell. So we'll stop it from binding to the surface, the receptor, it'll inhibit the reverse transcriptase, it'll inhibit the integrase from um, from integrating the, the, the viral genome into the host genome, and it'll um, inhibit the protease inhibitor, which um, opens the plasma membrane so the cells can um, lyse the cell. And um, most patients don't want to take uh, the, all of these medications every day. And all, the treatment could also be expensive, so many uh, patients are discouraged from taking their medications. And this is what leads to um, from to, for, for AIDS to progress from HIV infection infected patients to progress to AIDS patients, which the conditions worsen. And there, there's people that have very good treatment, like Magic, Magic Johnson, for example, and they could uh, they could live with uh, H they could live with an HIV positive infection for a really long time and uh, and not develop AIDS. And there's people that they don't have the same resources to be able to do this and they um, unfortunately they do not live this long also vaccines uh, there, there have been vaccine trials there have been vaccine trials but they have not been uh, have not been successful they have failed because uh, this is due to, because the HIV virus is um, very mutagenic it mutates very fast uh, HIV also avoids antibodies because it hides inside the cell, so the antibodies cannot bind to it and to sh and stop it. And um, also, we cannot use animals as trials because because um, the HIV only is effective in humans. You can't you cannot put an HIV in a uh, in um in an animal because it will have no but, but would it would not be able to survive. It needs a CD4 cell. And also, the volunteers can only volunteer once for the trials, and um, there's a high uh, liability insurance, so not most people want to uh, perform these experiments because it is costly. Because whatever you're giving the patients, it could uh, could um, hurt them, and this could be uh, this could be very expensive. Cause you could kill someone, basically. Uh, the, so there's currently there, there are currently attempts to to make a uh, a virus that binds that inhibits the self, but basically it targets the glycoprotein the glycoprotein 120, which is the main receptor that binds to the cell. So they're attempting to make a vaccine that will stop the cell from binding to the cell surface of the CD4 cell, and this way the the virus will not bind to the cell and um, the the HIV will not be able to infect the cell, and the HIV pro will not be able to uh, progress in its um uh, in its life. And also, um, this is has this has only one patient has been cured from um HIV, and this is uh, this is Timothy Ray Brown, which uh, received a bone marrow transfusion because um. Uh, because he had uh, lympho uh, he had leukemia. He was diagnosed with leukemia, and he also had an HIV. So his um, immune system was uh, basically destroyed. So by giving him a bone marrow transplant, uh, he would uh, be able to regenerate uh, the hematopoietic um, tissue in his body and be able to give rise to to uh, new cells, to immune cells and red blood cells. And all the cells in his, and most of the cells in his body, and um, the transfusion contained uh, DNA from uh, from a C CCR five delta thirty two um, gene, which is a mute, which is a mutated C CCR five receptor on the cell, which is the co receptor that the HIV virus needs to bind to to enter the cell. Since since this uh, receptor is mutated. Then uh, the HIV virus cannot enter the cell because the receptors inside the cell, so it cannot bind to it and enter the cell. And this this uh, type of uh, gene is only expressed in one percent of uh, European of European descent Caucasians. And um, and um, thanks to this, uh, he was cured from uh, from from HIV. So. He is no longer HIV positive. They they, they ran the, the the test, the HIV test on him, and he, he wasn't reactive for HIV anymore because of the the DNA that he received from the bone marrow transplant donor. 
uh, was able to co uh, code for for cells that um, expressed this uh, mutation on their CCR5 um, receptor. And I believe, like, I believe that if they study this thoroughly and they do experiments in this kind of um, in this kind of bone marrow transplant, I believe this could um, be somewhat of a cure for um, for patients in the future. So I want to thank you for listening to my presentation, and I uh, I hope this presentation encourages you to uh, find a cure for AIDS. Who knows, maybe one of you guys is the one that uh, actually cures AIDS in the future. So I want to thank you, and uh, please feel uh, free to ask any questions.